Okay, now I'm going to introduce our last but not least speaker who is live from ISO Kinetic Lab UITM Puncha Alam Campus. So he is Mr. Saiful Adli bin Bukri. So Mr. Saiful Adli bin Bukri graduated with Master of Musculoskeletal and Sport Physiotherapy from Australia. And he obtained his Bachelor of Physiotherapy and Diploma in Physiotherapy from University Technology Mara. He joined UITM till now as a lecturer at the Center of Physiotherapy Studies. His research interests include musculoskeletal, sports injury, and movement rehabilitation. He is currently doing his PhD in sport rehabilitation in UITM. Now, I would like to welcome Mr. Saiful Adli to deliver his talk. Please welcome. Uh, uh, can you hear my, my, my voice, Alif? Yes, yes. That's great. Really? Okay, thank, uh, thank you to the chairman today, Mr. Ali, for a short brief about myself. And I, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer, led by Dr. Azlenov, uh, for giving me an opportunity to share something about you, uh, of something to you guys. So today I'm going to share about the assessment of the risk factor for the sport injury. Okay, um, first of all, I would like to go to the injury in sport. Of course, we know that um, injuries occur for on the upper and lower extremities are common in the sports. And about 60% of it is involved the lower extremities and 60% of it are ankle and knee joints injury. Okay, why? is sport injury prevention important because the injury can cause the consequences it will affect the personal unhappiness it will be affect the emotional patient uh, players uh, got depressed uh, got unmotivated and the second one disabling a study said stated that 20 percent of the school child are absent from the school at least one day a year because of the sport-related injury. And one in three youth seek medical attention for the sport-related injury annually. And one in three workers' adults lost at least one day a year from work because of the sport-related injury. The third one is the high cost. High cost means that how much uh, the, you know, the government's individuals put on to manage their injury, uh, for example, for the rehabilitation, for the operation. A studies by the Australian estimate that direct costs on the sport-related injury over seven years to be 265 million Australian dollars. So it's very huge money was spent to manage the sport-related injury. And the fourth one, 8% of youth dropping out from the sport annually because of the injury or fear of injury. So this will impact on the quality of life, which is can increase the, you know, the case of the cancers, diabetics, hypertension, because they're dropping out from the sport. And the second one, if you drop from the sport, it mainly gain your weight and it tends to be obese. So everybody know that obese is not really good for our life, for our healthy. And the third one is can cause a post-traumatic arthritis. Okay, there is strategy in injury prevention. Okay, first of all, they look on the intrinsic, which is uh, athlete related. So they try to, you know, to modify the training strategy, to modify the risk factors such as strengths, endurance, balance, biomechanical, for example, landings, jumping, and flexibility, range of motion. And the second one, they try to modify the extrinsic risk, which is environmental. For example, they change the rule, they modify the rules, and they, they compulsory some uh, sports to wear some equipment to reduce the risk of the injury. So for example, you, uh, you, uh, you need to wear a wrist guard for snowboard, snowboarding, and you need to wear an ankle brace, you need to wear a mouth guard, you need to wear a shin pad to reduce the risk of the injury. So before we want to plant the uh, 
sorry, uh, we're going to look today only on the intrinsic factor, which is attributed. So we're going to look on the strength, endurance, balance, biomechanical, uh, flexibility, and also range of motion. And before you want to change the training strategy, or you want to uh, improve the strength of your athletes or your players, you need to identify, all right? You need to identify the player that in high risk of the injury and how you want to, to do it, how you want to identify the player with high risk of the injury. Okay, because due uh, lack of time, I'm going to focus on three aspects only, which is I'm going to uh, focus on the strength, balance, and also biomechanicals in landing. Okay, first of all, we go to the muscle strength, guys. All right, studies state that um, higher strength of the plantar flexor may be a predictive measure for sustaining an ankle injury. And the second study uh, stated that lower functional HQ ratio or conventional HQ ratio may predict the occurrence of the leg injury such as ACL and hamstring injury. So this is from a Boston and a team and also the small and a team in 2010. Okay, when I, I talk about the functional HQ ratio, conventional HQ ratio, it is a isokinetics. All right, it's a, it's about the isokinetics. So we're going to focus on the isokinetics today. All right. So what is a conventional HQ ratio? What is it? So it's a ratio between the strengths of the concentric contraction on agonist and antagonist in the knee joint. So we're going to focus on knee joint today because a knee and ankle is most current uh, injury in sports related injury. So it's about the concentric contraction of the agonist and antagonist in the knee joint. Studies stated that um, when you test the isokinetic and then you uh, calculate the conventional HQ ratio, the players or the athlete need to get greater than 0 0.60. When you calculate it, it's greater. So it means that your athlete is having low risk of injury. Uh, and it's a viable star. If less than 0 0.6 means that your athlete is in high risk of the injury. But the conventional HQ ratio, there is some limitation on the conventional HQ ratio because it's measured on the concentric contraction on the agonist and antagonist, which is not replicate the real situation during the sport-related uh, sport related activity, such as kicking. When, it, when we do kicking, for example, all right, the agonist, which is, con, uh, which is quadricep, is contract concentrically. And what happened on the hamstring? Actually, hamstring is contracting in eccentrically. Because of that, they come up with a new calculation, which is functional HQ ratio. What is a functional HQ ratio, guys? So the ratio between strengths on the concentric contraction on and eccentric contraction on antagonists in the knee joint. So Normative value for this ratio is 1.05 for biodex uh, isokinetic machine. Uh, so this one is specific on the biodex. Uh, there are several uh, brand of the isokinetic uh, and it may be difference in their normative value. So um, uh, you can see here, there is uh, the picture of the isokinetic or you can look at uh, behind me, there also an uh, isokinetic machine, which is we have this one is Biodex System 3. And recently they upgrade to Biodex System 4, but mostly it's pretty same. Okay, now we go to the procedure of the Biodex uh, isokinetic machine for the knee. So when you prepare your, your clients or your patients or your athletes, um, you need to, you know, you need to look, uh, make sure that a lateral epicondyle of the dominant leg and dominant knee was aligned with the dynamometer uh, rotational uh, axis. And then you need to make sure the distal calf was positioned two finger above 
of the mailers, lateral mailers, and you need to make sure your, your your clients or your athlete sit properly and comfort, and then you need to ask them to wear the upper body cross straps and a strap on the distal thigh because we want to just isolate uh, the contraction of the hamstring and quadricep on the dominant leg which is we to allow them to do some compulsory movement, excessive movement, because we want to isolate just for the hamstring and quadricep. And then after you prepare, now the time for the test. So you, your client was required to perform repeated maximum, you need to go for the maximum isokinetic contraction within 90 degrees of range of motion at a different speed, which is you can use a 60 uh, degree per second, or you can go for the 120, or you can go for 180 for concentric for five times. So this one for the concentric, and then you need to ask your clients had to resist again the passive external knee extension of a 90 degree range of motion at different speed during the eccentrics for five times. So the point number five is about the concentric contraction for the quadricep and hamstring. The point number six is more focusing on the eccentric contraction for the hamstring. So I have uh, a video on uh, during the isokinetic uh, testing. So I'm going to share it to you. So um from here you can see that uh, uh the tester or the physiotherapy try to give some encouragement to the athlete because we want them to go for the maximum effort. That's why we need to give some uh, you know encouragement, motivation for them to go for the for the higher for the maximums okay this is a uh, data that we can get from the isokinetic machines and we have a lot of data out there okay before you go for the data out there so you need to look uh, whether uh, you need to make sure the name is correct and then where is it what uh, we tested is a knee joint we tested on the knee joint and then the third one uh, is important uh, contraction types so this um, data mentioned here is a quantic over concentric it means that quadricep is in concentric contraction hamstring in a concentric contraction so the Fourth one is we look on the peak talk because we are talking about the conventional HQ ratio and also functional HQ ratio. So the most important uh, data that we're going to look today is a peak talk. Okay, so from the peak talk we can see here that extension. So extension is a quadriceps. It is a 60 degree per second. So this is a speed that we tested. So involved there is uninvolved and an involved knee. So uh, for the right and left, and then we go for the hamstring. Flexion is a hamstring, and they are also uh, uninvolved and involved knee. So also have a right and left. So can you see the 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 data down here, which is uninvolved for the extension is eighty seven point zero, and another one for the hamstring is fifty seven point three. All right, so I have a quiz for you guys. I want you guys to answer. It's very simple uh, question. So I want you, I want you guys to uh, calculate for me. What is Mr. Ed Smith HQ, conventional HQ ratio on the left knee? And is it Mr. Smith, Ed Smith is high or low risk of injury on the left knee? Okay, I give you guys about 30 seconds to, un to answer this question. You can put on the chat box. And Chalif also can answer this question. Chalif. <laughs>
Okay, I think everybody can answer this question. It's quite simple. So the answer is 0 0.69. So how I, I get the 0 0.69? It just, you know, uh, because the conventional HQ ratio. So you need to go and take the data for the hamstring, which is the hamstring. Uh, Q is a quadricep. So you take the hamstring, you know, you take the hamstrings um, for the left knee is a 57.3 and you divide uh, to 87.0. So you get this answer. All right, that's a conventional HQ ratio. And the second question is a low risk because I mentioned before, if the player got 0 0.65 and above, um, that player is low risk of the injury. Okay, Dr. Zelena got it right, right? Okay, good for you, good for you. Okay, now that's all about the uh, muscle strength. Now we go to the balance. All right, balance is a marker for the risk of lower limb injury is stated by Trailers at all 2018. And um, today I'm going to focus on the white balance test. Everybody know that white balance test is was simplified by the star exclusion balance test. The star exclusion balance test, there are a lot of uh, direction you need to go, but they've simplified it uh, to white balance test, which is only three direction you need to go, which is anterior, Postrolateral and also posteromedial. And from the picture here, you can see there is a special tool for the Y balance. It's quite good tools. I think the uh, in IS, in ISN they got one or two, but in UITM we only got one. Okay, it's quite it's not really expensive, but yeah, nowadays because of the financials, uh, you know. It's not really good enough, so we only uh, effort to buy one. So this one. It's easy because there is a block, so you need to push away the blocks, and then you can read the measurement uh, from the block. But if you don't have this kind of tools, you can make it by your own with the tips. And this is quite difficult because you need to uh, mark where the distance is, and then you need to read with your neck and eyes. So it's quite difficult. In terms of the reliability, so this white balance test shows very excellent in intra-tester reliability and also inter-tester reliability, according to PLISK et al. All right, now we go to the procedure for white balance test. Of course, before you start, you need to prepare uh, your white balance tape, and then you need to measure the true length. Length of your patients. And then you need to ask your players or your patients to put uh, the hand on the hip and maintain balance while reaching and returning to the bilateral stand. And then you need to go in order which direction you want to go. You need to go in order. First, you need to go on the dominant anterior. Then you go to the non-dominant anterior. The third one, you go dominant posterior lateral and then non-dominant posterior lateral. The fifth one, you go to dominant posterior medial. And the last one, you need to go to non-dominant posterior medial. And this trial was considered failed if uh, your players lost their balance through the movement or the raising both hands to balance their body or the touching the ground while reaching. And or they're lifting the standing leg heel during education. So for each direction, you need to go uh, three trials. So I have a picture on the white balance testing. So have a look, guys. And ask him to try to reach as far as possible along the tape stripe. He or she needs to perform three trials, standing on the right foot, reaching in the anterior direction, followed by the three trials, standing on the left foot, reaching in the anterior direction. This procedure is repeated for the postural medial and the postural lateral reach directions. The tape should be only touched lightly with the toes and the examiner marks the most distal point of contact on the tape. All right, so you need to mark with the Depends where exactly the distance where the exactly your players can go far. 
Okay, this is an example of the score sheet for Y balance test. And this is an example you can create by your own. So you need to take a three try so you can average it and then put on the table here for the left, for the right, and the this difference. So um so studies say that if the players or participants affected on the anterior is about um, more than 4 cm or the composite reach distance is less than 4% of limb length may predict leg injury. So if the right and left for the entry there are um, difference more than 4 cm, so the athlete or the player is considered in high risk of the injury. Another study uh, stated that the reduce of the posterior lateral duration for the right and the left uh, for white balance test has been associated with the risk of the ACL injury. So how, how you want to, okay, we go back to the composite reach distance. How you're going to calculate the composite reach distance? So you can use formula on the score sheet for white balance test. There is formula about the composite score. So you can uh, add on anterior, posterior medial, and posterior lateral, and you divide into uh, three times limb length and you times 100 so you got the composite uh, reach distance so this is about um, the y balance test now we go to the next one which is a biomechanical uh, in landing now i'm going to focus on the landing so what kind of assessment that i'm going to use today is i'm going to use the landing risk scoring system which is less so what is less less is a jump landing assessment tool and a screening tool to identify athletes at potential risk for ACL injury. This is developed by Padua et al. in 2015. And uh, they say that it's a good reliability and also the validity was moderate to the excellent. Okay, um, this is the activity that uh, in less, which is you need to start and you need to stood on the 30 cm high box and then you need to place a marker a dist at a distance of the half of body weight away from the landing area so for example your athlete is uh, 180 centimeter so you we need to put a marker uh, the distance from the box is about 90 centimeter so the the black one, the small black one is a marker. So this marker. So the athlete, okay, so you need to instruct uh, the athlete to jump forward. So they need to land just past the line. They need to pass the marker and then jump for the maximum high immediately after landing. When they land, ask them to maximum jump. All right. And this qualified or we need to repeat it again if the athletes or players doesn't jump vertically uh, if they jump vertically from the box so mean it's not pass over the line all right it's below the line so the second one did not jump for the maximum height of the landing so you need to monitor if you think that your athlete is doesn't go for the maximum jumping so you need to ask them to repeat so of course we're going to record all this activity because we are going to look on the uh, video analysis so you need to put a camera in front and also on the right side of the uh, client or athlete so the distance between the camera and landing area should be three meters so you're going to take the frontal and sagittal image of our athlete during that activity. So you need to have some a smartphone or camera which is in a slow motion mode. So this is a landing error scoring system item. Uh, the landing error scoring system uh, consists about uh, 70 item, 17 item. And the scoring is made from the review, the video recording. So for example, all right, you you go and analyze the video. The first uh, item is a knee flexion, initial context. The knee is is flexed less than thirty degree at initial context. 
when you look on the video and it seems that uh, the knee during the initial contact is less than a 30 degree flexion so you just stick on the present okay if more than 30 degrees you take on the absent so the second one uh, we're going to analyze the hip flexion during the initial contact when you look the thigh is in line with the trunk at the initial contact okay the thigh uh, uh, is in line with the trunk so you look on the video there is a hip flexion means it's not in line with the trunk so you can put absent if the thigh is in line you just put a present you take on the present so you can go through all this item guys i'm going to share this uh slide uh to you i'm going to give to the organizer and they're going to share it to you so you can go through all the items so maybe some of you uh, will ask me how you want to know uh, is it less than 30 degree or is it is it more than 45 degree uh, of the angle so actually you can cooperate with the Canovia, uh, Canovia software. You can download on the Canovia, Canovia software and then you can analyze it uh, accurately, which is you can make a line on the joint and then the software can manage to, uh, to let you know what is the angle is. So it's quite easy. Uh, software, this software is, uh, uh, is good actually. So, how about the scoring? So you need to total all the score. And then when the total score um, is five or more, it indicates that individual is at risk, greater risk of sustaining non-contract or indirect contact ACL injury. So if athlete or players got more than five, so they seem to uh, have a high risk of ACL injury. This is from Padua. Okay, that's all about the landing error scoring system. Um, and recently, when you go out there and you uh, read on the articles, recently they uh, will cooperate the risk injury assessment with fatigue. So they're going to look. The risk injury assessment during the fatigue. So risk and uh, risk injury assessment should focus on the movement quality and should be conducted in the fatigue state. Injury occurred toward at the end of the first and second half of the match play, which is associated with a fatigue level that presents toward at the end of the match. And a lot of studies stated that fatigue is a risk factor of injury in sports. And this is a study by, from the BOSUD uh, in 2015. They, they tried to look whether the participant uh, without fix, if they have a high risk of injury. And from their result, they show, it shows that uh, uh, the participant without fatigue has low risk of the injury. And when they induce a fatigue to the same participants, and the result will be different. This difference, which is the participant, the same participant has high risk of the injury. And also a study by the Small et al. 2010, the, um, is, uh, the result also same as a suit. So guys, um, it's good if you can cooperate the uh, risk injury assessment with a fatigue simulation. So there's a lot a lot of uh, fatigue simulation out there that you can choose. So here I'm, I'm showing it to you just for the soccer itself. In soccer, there's a lot of fatigue simulation and out there there's some general fatigue simulation. So you can choose anyone that you want. So I think that's all before I end up my, you know, my sharing session, I would like to wrap up. Uh, my presentation today. Many people dropping out of the sports because of the injury or fear of injury that will impact the quality of life. Therefore, injury risk assessment is crucial in detecting the people with the high risk of the injury. So injury prevention program will more 
focus on people with the high risk of the injury and it's very good if you can cooperate your injury risk assessment with a fatigue simulation. I think that's all from me, uh, Chair Alif, for today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, to Mr. Ali for that very interesting and yet again, very informative session. I'm pretty sure that everyone have fruitful session from his talk. Okay, now we go to our Q&A session. Apparently we have one question from Okay, from Muhammad Azan Nashrim, his question is, um, Hello, Sir Adli. I wonder if manually using the tape instead of using the block for y balance test will affect the end result of the test. Thank you. Say it again, Ali. can't get that question. Okay, I wonder if manually using the tape instead of the block for y balance test will affect the end result of the test. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Okay, maybe it will affect the uh, outcome or the result because, you know, sometimes the athlete or the players want to touch it quickly because they want to go for the maximum distance that they can go. So they're going to do it quick. And then from that, you cannot, sometimes you cannot uh, focus on it where exactly uh, they touch it. So you need to focus and then you get the correct. If you are not focusing, you won't get it correct. So it's different from the blocks. So they can touch as quick as they can, and then the block will stop there, and you can look uh, exactly what where the blocks up, and then you can take the measurement. It will affect definitely. Okay, I, think, I hope I think, that answers. Yep, I hope that. 